psychopathy, characterized by selfishness, impulsiveness, and antisocial personality traits, has since been described as a mental illness. But is it really? Obviously, in today's society, being a psychopath and taking advantage of others is not exactly a good thing to do. But what if these people, diagnosable psychopaths, don't have control over their actions? What if this is actually an evolutionary adaptation, similar to the niche of a parasite, that takes advantage of those around them for their own personal gain? Well, the only way to find out is to look into the research, which is exactly what I did. As popularized by Klecky in 1941, psychopathy is thought to be an expression of trait-based personality deficits. Traits such as a lack of remorse, untruthfulness, or insincerity are what define it. Many of these traits were incorporated into the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder in the second edition of the DSM. Over time, however, most of Klecky's characteristics were removed from the diagnostic criteria of antisocial personality disorder in favor of other indicators that could be more reliably assessed. Ever since then, there has been an ongoing debate about the relationship between psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder. Some argue that they have evolved into distinct personality disorders, while others propose that APD represents the milder end of the psychopathy continuum. While a diagnosis of APD is closely related to the behavioral and antisocial parts of psychopathy, it's not as strongly connected to the core traits of psychopathy that involve how people relate and feel. Currently, APD is still listed as a disorder in the most recent edition of the DSM, the DSM-5, and a diagnosis of APD requires the individual to show a disregard for the rights of others since age 15, as indicated by three or more of the following features. One, failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behavior. Two, deceitfulness. Three, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Four, irritability and aggressiveness. Five, reckless disregard for the safety of themselves or others, six, consistent irresponsibility, and seven, a lack of remorse. In diagnosing the disorder, the presence of conduct disorder before the age of 15 is what is the most important part. By and large, the scientific and mental health community share the same outlook on psychopathy. For example, Hart and Hare in 1996 said, given the morbidity of psychopathy and its negative impact on society, it is difficult to imagine that any mental disorder, except for maybe schizophrenia, could be considered a greater public health concern. Yet despite the widespread belief that psychopathy is a mental disorder, an alternative but more controversial perspective has been proposed. Psychopathy is an adaptation. And more specifically, that psychopathy is maintained by negative frequency dependent selection, which means it could be advantageous when it is less common in the population. The idea has been supported by various researchers. And according to this view, the risk-taking, opportunistic, and manipulative behavior exhibited by psychopaths would have increased reproductive success in ancestral environments, but only under specific conditions, such as a high ratio of cooperators to psychopaths. In a study from 2021 by Pullman and colleagues, they looked into this very question. They had a clear idea on how to tackle the ongoing debate about whether psychopathy is a mental disorder or a different strategy shaped by evolution. Their hypothesis focused on whether those with psychopathy had more or fewer differences in how their brains develop compared to those without psychopathy. The problem with trying to measure neurodevelopmental deviations is they are difficult to assess directly, but that doesn't mean they can't be measured indirectly. Being left-handed or having mixed-handedness can indicate problems in brain development. For more information, you can check out the studies by Schmitz, A. Al, and Bishop in 1990. In order to explore differences in how brains develop, the researchers investigated whether psychopaths are more likely to be left-handed compared to non-psychopathic individuals. If the data shows that more psychopaths have deviations from right-handedness, it suggests that psychopathy leans more towards being a mental disorder. However, if these neurological differences are equally common in both groups, it could be evidence that psychopathy is more of a strategic adaptation for exploitation. So what is a mental disorder? From an adaptationist perspective, Wakefield in 1992 has defined the concept of mental illness as a harmful dysfunction. Dysfunction refers to when something within us, like our body, mind, or feelings, doesn't work as it should. Harmful means that the problem leads to bad outcomes according to how society and culture see it. For something to be seen as a mental disorder, both these conditions must be met. It must be not working right and it must be causing harm. The precise cause of the specific internal dysfunction might vary depending on the mental illness in question, and there may be many such cases. But even with that said, there are some common features present among many mental disorders. Although the causes of major mental dysfunctions are not fully understood, it's generally believed that mental illnesses result from a combination of various factors, including including environmental influences, genetics, and even random occurrences. Extreme forms of psychopathy are almost always certainly dysfunctional, 
as they would likely have been in ancestral environments as well. But this is true of any adaptation. A bone can be too dense, a tail can be too long, and a feeling can be too strong. If a trait has been strongly chosen by nature, we expect it to have a usual and beneficial form, which we call an adaptation. This form worked well in the past and was better than other choices. However, if a trait has different ways it can develop or work, we can expect a variety of forms around the usual one. Some of these might not be great and at the extremes might even cause problems. Behavioral differences are a good example that fall into this category. These less than ideal forms aren't the main adaptation we're talking about, as they weren't the favorites of nature's choice. And if these forms are also harmful, we call them disorders. Thus, the question remains whether psychopathy on average shows evidence of disorder or adaptation. Neurodevelopmental deviations are conditions that affect brain development before, during, and after birth. These differences in development are most commonly considered environmentally caused, but can also arise from genetic mutations or abnormalities. The causes of neurodevelopmental disturbances can occur during gestation, say for instance because of things like maternal malnutrition or infection, or during adolescence due to head injuries. These factors are believed to influence the formation and functioning of critical brain structures. For example, an increased risk of schizophrenia is associated with various causes that potentially affect neurodevelopment, including maternal malnutrition, infection, childhood trauma, and so on and so forth. While not as extensively studied, neurodevelopmental disturbances have also been linked to other major mental illnesses. But what about handedness? In a recent meta-analysis of over 2 million people, it was found that approximately 10.6% of the population is left-handed. Now this is relevant because it is thought that the human population bias for right-handedness stems from selection pressures throughout evolutionary history. The human body shows both structural and functional asymmetries, which are largely genetically influenced. Brain lateralization is one type of asymmetry where certain tasks in the brain are more active in one side compared to the other. This asymmetry evolved to avoid redundant neural circuits and prevent tasks from overlapping too much. Think of brain lateralization as having two parts in your brain, the left and right. Each part is good at different jobs. For example, the left side is better at handling language and talking, while the right side is better at understanding pictures and finding your way around. This split brain setup helps your brain work efficiently because each side can focus on its strengths without getting in the way of the other side. As the left part of the brain is more dominant in linguistic processing and controls the right side of the body, right hand dominance may be the result of the brain's functional asymmetry for language processing. This makes sense as it is thought that language development was a primary factor that led to the development of our large brains. But given the strong human bias for right handedness, what causes non right handedness? The mechanisms by which handedness develops are not known, but they likely occur very early in life. The idea that genes alone determine whether someone is left-handed or right-handed, like models from Annette in 1967 and McCannis in 1985, isn't enough to explain why people have different hand preferences. Recent research has shown that the amount of variation in hand preference due to genes is actually quite low during childhood and adulthood. Likewise, common or shared environmental effects are also small. Instead, the brain factors that lead to handedness are random or unpredictable developmental processes that happen uniquely to each person. Similar to minor physical anomalies, non-right handedness has been found to be related to low birth weight, birth complications, prenatal stress, as well as overexposure to prenatal hormones. The research shows that when critical brain structures are affected during early brain development, people are more likely to be left-handed. For example, individuals with major mental illnesses like schizophrenia or depression are more likely to be left-handed compared to healthy individuals. However, there's another viewpoint that considers left-handedness as a result of how common it is in the population. But characterizing psychopathy as a mental illness or a mental disorder has not gone unchallenged. Back in 1987, Sobos put forth the idea of a cheating adaptation. The notion revolves around specific genetic traits that offer advantages to individuals who choose not to return favors within a community. The concept is illuminated by game theory, a field that studies strategic interactions among individuals. The authors suggested that, in humans, psychopathy is the phenotype for this cheating adaptation. Mealy in 1995 further expanded this adaptionist hypothesis, arguing that there are two pathways by which psychopathy can be expressed. Primary psychopathy is a specific life strategy linked to certain inherited genes that create a set of personality traits. These traits like callousness, manipulativeness, and lack of remorse can be advantageous 
as long as they are not common in the population. The strategy is maintained by negative frequency dependent selection, which means it works best when these traits are less common among the broader population as a whole. Secondary psychopathy is a flexible life strategy influenced by environmental factors. It arises based on specific conditions individuals face. Traits associated with psychopathy like manipulative behavior emerge when they are expected to help individuals thrive in their particular environment. While Mealy provided a promising perspective, there's little evidence to support this evolutionary-based form of psychopathy. For instance, when looking at conduct disordered behavior in young people, aversive family environments usually predict such behavior. However, for youth with high callousness and unemotional traits, their family environment does not play a significant role in predicting conduct disordered behavior. Instead, individuals with these traits are more likely to engage in such behavior regardless of their family environment. In understanding the causes of crime in general, Lalamir et al. proposed three different pathways that can lead to assault. The first pathway is known as the young male syndrome where young men resort to coercive behavior to gain access to mates because they feel competitively disadvantaged in terms of resources and status. This behavior is typically limited to adolescence and young adulthood, and it tends to stop when they can compete for mates through legitimate means. The second pathway is a life course persistent pathway, where individuals face disadvantaged social environments and neurodevelopmental disturbances. Similar to the young male syndrome, they resort to assault because they cannot compete for mates in socially accepted ways. The antisocial behavior is expected to persist into adulthood due to the cumulative and lasting effects of their challenging life circumstances. The third pathway involves psychopathy. In this case, individuals are healthy and capable of competing for mates in pro-social ways, but they choose sexual coercion when the benefits outweigh the potential costs. Unlike the life course persistent pathway, psychopathic individuals do not face neurodevelopmental disturbances. Instead, Psychopathy is considered an alternative life history strategy. According to this view, the risk-taking, opportunistic, and callous traits of psychopaths increase their reproductive success in past environments by exploiting the trusting cooperative individuals who form the majority of the population. Thus, psychopathy is not a mental disorder, despite the harm it causes others, as it is not related to the failure of an evolved psychological mechanism, but is instead an alternative strategy that has been selected for because of its positive effects on personal fitness. As we've discussed earlier, studying neurodevelopmental disturbances is crucial in understanding the causes of mental illness. So if we find evidence showing a positive link between psychopathy and such disturbances, it would support the mental disorder model. On the other hand, if we find no or a negative link, it would support the adaptive life history model. In simpler terms, if psychopathy is a mental disorder, we would expect to see more signs of developmental problems, behavioral issues, and reproductive challenges in psychopaths. But if this is not the case, then it is an adaptation. Both models agree that extreme psychopathy might lead to problems in today's world, like highly psychopathic individuals ending up in jail for most of their adult lives. However, the adaptive life history model suggests that this won't be the case on average. So far, Psychopathy is not associated with elevated rates of developmental distress. For example, Lorimal and et al. in 2001 discovered that psychopathy scores were linked to lower levels of neurodevelopmental issues, such as infections during birth or fluctuating asymmetry, which is like small random differences from perfect symmetry in certain body structures. Moreover, individuals who didn't engage in criminal behavior had a lower rate of fluctuating asymmetry compared to non-psychopathic offenders. However, there was no difference in fluctuating asymmetry between non-offenders and psychopathic offenders. Similarly, Brazil et al. did not find differences in fluctuating asymmetry between university students scoring high and low on a measure of psychopathy. Finally, Using structural equation modeling, Harris et al. in 2001 found that although psychopathy and measures of neurodevelopmental disturbances such as low IQ are both associated with criminal behavior, they are not associated with each other. Psychopaths also show selective behavior. They are more prone to commit instrumental, goal-directed crimes like robbery rather than reactive, emotional ones like revenge. They are more likely than other defenders to engage in precocious and coercive sexual behavior and to target adults over children in their sexual offenses. And unlike people diagnosed with other mental illnesses, psychopaths are no more likely than other offenders to harm their related family. Lastly, while individuals with serious mental disorders tend to have fewer offspring, Psychopathy scores among offender and community samples are positively associated with the number of children produced. Notably, there are many studies that have investigated structural and functional brain differences between psychopathic and non-psychopathic individuals. And yes, psychopaths have been discovered to have different brain structures compared to the general population. However, it is important to note that differences in brain structure do not necessarily mean they have deficits or dysfunctions. 
It just means they are different, as emphasized by Krupp et al. in 2013. To the extent that psychopaths differ behaviorally from non-psychopaths, neurological differences between them must exist, and they must reflect either dysfunctional or alternative functional brain organization. Handedness can provide more distinct predictions about psychopathy, which are relevant to both the mental disorder and alternative life history viewpoints on the origin of psychopathy. In the end, the researchers did not find any support for the mental disorder model of psychopathy. Psychopaths or individuals with higher psychopathy scores did not show higher rates of non-right-handedness compared to non-psychopaths or individuals with lower psychopathy scores. When comparing psychopathic patients to non-psychopathic mental health patients, if the psychopathic patients do not have other clinical conditions while the non-psychopathic patients do, the lack of difference in handedness would also support the mental illness perspective. The result of this study gave evidence both in favor of and against the idea that psychopathy is an adaptive life strategy. People with high psychopathy scores in the community showed no difference in handedness compared to those with low psychopathy scores, which supports the adaptive life history strategy. But when comparing psychopathic offenders to non-psychopathic offenders, there was no difference in handedness, which is not entirely in line with the adaptive life history strategy view, especially if the non-psychopathic offenders have mental disorders. When the researchers looked at the relationship between handedness and different aspects of psychopathy within the offender group, they found interesting patterns. Offenders with higher scores on the interpersonal affective dimension of psychopathy, considered the core features of psychopathy, had lower rates of non-right handedness. On the other hand, those with higher scores on the behavioral dimension of psychopathy more similar to antisocial personality disorder and ongoing offending had higher rates of non-right-handedness compared to the comparison groups. Lastly, in the comparison between psychopathic and non-psychopathic mental health patients, there were no differences in handedness, which supports the adaptive life history perspective. To test this perspective, the most relevant comparison would be between psychopathic individuals with no other mental illness and those with a major mental illness. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any articles that directly compare these two groups. In separate studies, Webb et al. in 2013 found that 40% of patients with schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder were left-handed, while Lolimar et al. in 2001 found that only 8% of psychopathic offenders were left-handed using the same measure. This is slightly below the population's usual prevalence of left-handedness. Additionally, in different studies, Carolyn et al. in 2014 discovered that 6% and Salim et al. in 2015 found that 0% of individuals from their university samples who scored high in psychopathy didn't have any other major mental illnesses and were left-handed. In conclusion, the results are still kind of vague, but lean in the direction of psychopathy being more of an adaptation than a mental illness. All in all, what do you think? Is psychopathy adaptive or is it a mental disorder? All I can do is lay out the research on it. The real answer is for you to look into and decide.